will be presented by Nicole Bauer, uh, who is an assistant professor at the University of Tulsa, recently employed, recently minted PhD from the University of North Carolina, uh, where she worked uh, with Jay Smith, <coughs> writing a dissertation in the Kingdom of Shadows, Secrecy and Transparency in 18th Century France. And with my keen eye for clever titles, I couldn't miss the one where uh, you have forthcoming in an 18th century studies uh, 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 publication, Desire, Dread, and the Grateful Dead. <laughs> the Bastille, its cadavers, and the revolutionary Gothic imagination. I can't wait to read that. That sounds really interesting. Today she's going to talk to us about a swashbuckling commissaire, the 18th century Paris police on the small screen. Nicole. Thank you. Um, so microphone, is it good? Yep, okay, great. All right, let's see if I can get this up. Okay. All right, here we are. Well, um, so for my presentation, I'll just be talking about one show and there'll be a focus on the Paris police in the 18th century but with some discussion of Ancien Regime kings. So, um, a swashbuckling commissaire, the 18th century Paris police on the small screen. Audiences will probably never tire of seeing gruesome murders just as they seem to have a bottomless appetite for the glamorous, the grisly, and everything in between in the Ancien Regime. In this paper, I will focus on one television show, Nicolas Le Floc. This show is CSI meets pre-revolutionary France meets romance and adventure. Each episode is set in the 18th century and features a murder mystery solved by the eponymous police commissaire. Nicolas Le Floc is a French television show that aired from 2008 to 2015. The television show is based on the novels of Jean-Francois Parrault and has aired in several countries, including Japan and the United States. Probably because the show was based on novels, whose author clearly visited the Bastille and police archives, the show is well researched with sophisticated, albeit sometimes overly complicated, plot lines. Nicolas Lufloc is fascinating both for what it includes and what it omits. The audience sees an ancien regime of gallantry and intrigue, elegance and danger, where kings and the police are well-intentioned, but sometimes uh, misled by corrupt aristocrats, wicked ministers, and other evildoers, both in the glittering court of Versailles and in the seedy neighborhoods of Paris. It is both a romanticized 19th century version of the old regime and a portrayal of kings and their courts that we would recognize in the early years of the French Revolution, that is, that reform was needed, but good kings were misled by bad ministers. The viewer also sees how the police were everywhere, always watching. But not how, so they're always watching, but they, the show does not show how hated they were on the eve of the revolution. But what is probably most interesting and troubling is its portrayal of sexuality, where some of the most vicious killers in the show are those who do not conform to the dominant uh, form of masculinity or do not fall into neat gender categories. So, portrayals of the police in film and fiction usually fall into three categories. The police are inept, sometimes comically so. The police are corrupt and prosecute the poor while shielding the rich and powerful from justice. Or the police are virtuous. Here the police are virtuous, but the show hardly does justice to the mammoth apparatus that was the Paris police in the 18th century. At this time, the Paris police were considered the most modern and successful in Europe. Other European capitals attempted to emulate them as best they could. Under the Ancien Regime, the police were headed by a chief called the Lieutenant General or Lieutenant General, and under him were commissaires who investigated crime scenes and conducted interrogations at the Bastille or at the Châtelet, the old prison that was the police headquarters. 
beneath the commissaire were the many inspectors who carried out the business of the police in the streets. Stakeouts, following suspects, gathering evidence, staying in touch with the vast network of police spies called mush or flies. The police had spies everywhere, from street urchins to tavern drunks to madams of brothels. Along with performing the criminal investigations of a contemporary police force, the police in the Ancien Regime also had administrative duties, like the management of public health and keeping streets clean. They were both a major arm of the justice system and had several other administrative capacities that today would be handled by health and public safety officials. In the show, Le Floc is a commissaire who wears a sword and runs through the streets collecting evidence and chasing suspects. Le Floc is also the Marquis de Ranroy, a noble from an impoverished family in Brittany who came to Paris apparently out of his love for fighting crime. Being a noble probably facilitates the many sword fights you will see, uh, as he would have been trained in fencing from an early age, though it seems unlikely that a commissaire in the 18th century would be from a noble background. His rank, though, gives him entree to the royal court where half of the intrigue takes place. In actuality, being a commissaire was more of a desk job with the inspectors doing most of the legwork. The show begins in the 1760s, and the chief of police at the time was a formidable man named Antoine de Sartine. Sartine was the able lieutenant general of police from 1759 to 1774, and later served as minister of the navy. He survived the revolution by fleeing soon after the storming of the Bastille. During his tenure as chief of police, he was one of the most powerful men in Paris and because he, directed, he answered directly to the king, and he was a very shrewd and skillful official, managing the police's vast network of spies and keeping an eye out for any subversive activity. As a character in the show, that's him on the right, the character, Sartine plays a major role in the show as the hero's feckless superior and foil. Though the historical figure was a talented man simultaneously holding all the strings in the police's wide web, in the show, he sp spends more time tending to his many wigs and creating messes that the hero has to clean up for him. The show also fails to make it clear to what extent the police were reviled, especially in the later years of the Ancien Regime. This is a pamphlet that was very popular during the revolution, written, you probably heard of him, uh, Pierre Manuel. It's the police of Paris unveiled and it's showing all their abuses and there you see the Bastille in the background and this guy being led away in chains by the police and of course this is an allegory of France languishing under this oppressive regime. So uh, the real Sartine certainly understood how public opinion had turned against the police and that was why he fled so early in the revolution. The police were hated because as many late 18th century authors and pamphleteers observed the police had spies everywhere and seemed to pry into everyone's privacy, even opening letters, while they themselves remained opaque to the public. Along with hating the police for their supposed abuses of power, many in the public believed that the police were implicated in what was called the famine plot, especially Sartine, he was blamed for this. The show devotes an entire episode to the famine plot, or Pacte de Famine, where, according to the rumors, Wealthy aristocrats, with the help of the police, hoarded grain in order to drive up the price of flour, leading to the starving poor being forced to pay exorbitant prices. There was most likely no such plot, but starting in the 1760s, the government began to experiment with lifting the price ceilings on flour, inspired by new ideas about the free market. In 1775, the finance minister, Turgot, removed government control of grain prices, and pr the prices skyrocketed. Ordinary people still had little understanding of economic forces, and when prices became exorbitant, rumors began to circulate that the price of grain had gone up because the wealthy were hoarding flour. Some even believed that Louis XVI was involved. In the show, the young and newly enthroned Louis XVI is innocent and follows Turgot's lead, doing what he thinks is best for his people. A cabal of evil courtiers, led by the Prince de Conti, are jealous of Turgot and wish to discredit him and so they spread rumors of a famine plot and even hoard grain to drive up prices and stir up public discontent and desperation, planning to ruin Turgot and, wish, and planning to ruin Turgot even at the expense of the monarchy's reputation. Then a baker with a suspicious amount of flour hidden in his cellar is found murdered. By the poison of an exotic snake, incidentally, a black mamba, 
as Lefloc's forensic team discovers, though it is never clear why the baker has to be murdered by a mamba. Using his detective abilities and sometimes going undercover as a member of the discontented rabble, Lefloc slowly discovers what the cabal of aristocrats is up to and literally runs, hollering in alarm, to Versailles to report to the king. So here's a clip of him uh, investigating. That's him. That's the king. Okay, so Louis the Sixteenth is portrayed as inexperienced, shy, a little naive, but full of good intentions. Lefloc often finds him working at his forge or on his clocks, his favorite hobby, and he trusts Lefloc implicitly. He sends Lefloc to investigate further, and as the commissaire closes in on the murderer and the man who has been doing the dirty work for Conti, the bad guy, he finds first his girlfriend and then his superior in mortal danger. Sartine is innocent in the story, but he foolishly hired the murderer to look out for Lefloc and his girlfriend while on dangerous missions, and the villain ends up kidnapping the love interest and then trying to kill Sartine when Sartine discovers his evil intentions. So here's a couple of clips of that. So there's the mamba, and he uh, defeats the snake, 
and now he's going to go rescue his boss. Sartine's sad her term, her to tone, vous avez voulu me faire tuer, Nicolas. So Sartine, uh, boss, his incompetence, of course, helps give the intrepid hero even more luster. He is the equivalent, Nicolas, of the clever, observant detective in a modern day setting who sometimes has to go rogue because his superiors are too thick headed, but always gets the bad guy in the end and saves the day and often the girl. Le Floc's masculinity is a bit of the James Bond variety, but with French finesse and passion. He is handsome, witty but frank, and enormously successful with women. The women, there, for their part, are usually love interests, prostitutes who give him tips and simultaneously come on to him, and murderers who are usually jilted ex-mistresses of the victim out for revenge. Given its implicit celebration of French culture and elegance in the 18th century, it is surprising how little we see of the influence and agency women exercised in the old regime. For instance, Madame de Pompadour is only featured in one episode and very briefly. Though the show begins while she is still alive, we barely see how she was a patron of certain philosophes and how much power she wielded. At the height of her influence in the 1750s, Pompadour more or less did the work of a prime minister and acted as gatekeeper to many positions at court, as Thomas Kaiser demonstrated in his well-written article. She even helped engineer the alliance between Louis XV and Maria Theresa of Austria. Similarly, many women at court, or who ran salon, acted as gatekeepers and enjoyed a great deal of social and cultural power, which Antoine Lilti has discussed in his book on the salon. Granted, the show is a murder mystery, action-packed and designed for entertainment, and it is not very concerned with Enlightenment philosophy or the role of women in 18th century France. 
But considering how much research the writers were willing to do to understand court politics and various crises in the latter half of the century, the omission of women with agency beyond their sexuality is disappointing. As for male sexuality, the show tends to cast those who do not, do not conform to the hero's kind of masculinity as suspect, if not downright amoral and corrupt. Far from dwelling in what Dwar Warman calls the ancien regime of gender and identity, the show has more of a 19th century distrust of gender ambiguity. They are certainly slippery characters not to be trusted and usually up to no good. In one episode, the murderer is a particularly ruthless and cunning Italian castrato singer whose beautiful voice and effeminate mannerisms seem to go hand in hand with the sly but cruel manner in which he dispatches his victims. He is a threatening other, both for his being Italian and being too effete. The show also touches on the secret dens of homosexuality in 18th century Paris, but only to briefly portray a male prostitute as a sword for hire who attempts to kill the hero. The male prostitute is also of African descent, though the show hardly explores race. One of the show's most sadistic and bloodthirsty villains is a hermaphrodite who sometimes dresses in women's clothes and sometimes in men's. The episode centers on the rivalry between two powerful ministers at court, the Duc de Choiseul and the Comte de saint florentin De Choiseul plots to discredit de saint florentin by having a series of gruesome murders take place in his house. The villain happily carries out the murders by using a silver claw that tears out the throats of his victims. In this court rivalry, the gendered ambiguity of the killer adds nothing to the plot. But it does show how desperate de Choiseul is to discredit his rival that he would hire someone so unsavory to carry out his plan. We later learn that the killer has tortured prostitutes and engages in orgies. He exudes both a vampiric and snake-like quality and is equally deadly in feminine and masculine attire. He hisses like a viper or a cat. And when he attempts to kill the hero, the hero's friend is able to fend him off only with a whip like a wild animal. So here are some clips for you. Okay, so that's them hiring the killer. And here is um, oh, one of Le Floch's informants, a madam of a brothel. Ah, 
Okay, and then this is the attack. I'll start it maybe a minute in, in the interest of time. Hope the picture's good. And then here is the um, little aftermath. So here's this beautiful romance blossoming between the hero and his love interest. And you could see that rather than adding to the plot, the supposed gender confusion or perversion of these characters serves as a symbol and signifier of their warped morality. And if I could just show you one more quick Assassinated. clip. Let's see here. A discussion of gender. So there they're discussing one of the villains. So in the end, the hero always solves the case and often saves the damsel or boss in distress, though sometimes the bigger fish, the powerful court noble or well-connected intriguer escapes justice to wreak havoc another day. Nicolas Le Floc is an enjoyable murder mystery with high production values and engaging storylines. There is a lot the casual viewer can learn about court politics and even some of the political upheavals of the second half of the 18th century. We do not have a good picture, however, of how large the, an apparatus the Paris police was at the time, or how much they were hated, especially in the later years of the Ancien Regime. We see a somewhat romanticized Ancien Regime that was full of beauty and danger. Unfortunately, despite its good writing and thorough research, there is little room for the agency and influence that many women enjoyed in this period, and the problematic depiction of sexuality tells us more about contemporary writers' prejudices rather than those of the 18th century. Thank you.